What is up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Breathe and Air podcast, where everyday action meets extraordinary mindset. We have an amazing guest for you today. He is a health and wellness expert, an entrepreneur, consultant, Amazon best-selling author of his book, Change Your Mind, Change Your Destiny, and he also has his own podcast, Unlimited Wealth. Jay LaGuardia, thank you so much for joining the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Mason. And just one, cla- one, one uh, correction. Okay. The podcast name is Power, Passion, Prosperity. Power, Passion, Prosperity. All right. That's yeah. my bad. So tell us, no little, tell us a little bit about the podcast. So Power, Passion, Prosperity was started uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, it's, uh, it kind of took off. There was one day I was, uh, I was doing some meditation. It was actually a really cold January day, it was snowing. I'm up here in Wisconsin, so we get a lot of that kind of weather. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, I start, oftentimes I start my meditation with a question and I just kind of, you know, see where it takes me. And the question I had that day was, if there was three things I had to do, I had to de- define and identify which have been at the core of my own success, what would it be? So as I was going through that meditation, which was actually a longer process, I normally do about 25 minutes a day, and it was wound up being close to an hour. Three words kept coming back, right? Empowering, empowerment, passion, and prosperity. So I've been empowered by other people, um, by books, by podcasts, by mentors, um, friends. They empower me to think bigger. They inspire me to... Uh, step up to my greatest self. And then anything I've ever had passion or passion about in my life, I've been very successful with. Because when you're passionate about something, obstacle and adversity never gets in your way. You figure out a way to get through it. And eventually, you know, you reach your goal. And then ultimately prosperity, prosperity in all aspects of life, mental, physical, financial, spiritual well-being. You know, that's a broad balanced life. When people talk about a balanced life, what's a balanced life? It's prosperity in all these areas. It's not just financial, you know, having money in the bank because, you know, you know, I know I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs who have been successful, but have had terrible family life, poor marriages, bad relationships, you know, no connection with their kids, terrible health. So it's abundant prosperity in all these areas. And so at that moment, I said, you know what? I need to step up and play bigger and share this story. And that's how the podcast came about in September of 18. And we've just been growing and expanding and really rocking and rolling here. Um, Particularly, as I mentioned, the last year, we've had a lot, a lot of growth. So I want to thank everybody out there who checks it out because apparently they like what they hear. Yeah, that's incredible. And you are very well versed in your area of expertise. So tell me a little bit, you mentioned meditation. What has your journey with meditation been like? It started at a necessity. Um, you know, there are moments in your life, seminal moments, you're, you're a young guy, you probably have a couple, but I've had a few more years on you. So I've had a few seminal moments in my life. And um, it occurred uh, when I was, uh, it was, it was about 29 and, and we had uh, our first daughter. We had just bought our first business. My wife and I were both chiropractors and we had bought one of the largest practices in the country. And uh, living up here in Wisconsin, away from my family, I'm from the East Coast. And I was going through a lot of transition. It was very, very difficult for me. And I didn't adjust and adapt well. And then I bought this business and it was contracting. It went down by 30% in the first 18 months. So freaking out, you know, we would struggle at home, struggle with my wife, struggle with our business, and uh, had a lot of anxiety and panic attacks. At the time, I didn't know, you know, what was really coming to this. And it was, you know, all this pressure. And uh, I was experiencing depression. I remember one afternoon, my wife said to me, she goes, Let's, let's just go out. Let's go grab a coffee, go to the bookstore, take our daughter. And uh, she likes to read and we'll go find her some new books. And I really didn't want to go. And she forced me to go. And, and, uh, and when my wife speaks up like that, I, I usually listen because her intuitiveness is, is very strong. And so we went to a Borders bookstore, which I don't even think is I Immediately when I walked into this bookstore, I was drawn to the back portion of the bookstore and I had never been there before it was the personal growth section. But not just the section, 
but a specific aisle and shelf, literally drawn to it. So you want to you talk, you know, inspiration, or you want to be, you know, say it was, you know, the hand of God who was leading me. Doesn't matter to me. But something higher was calling me. And at the bottom of that shelf was a cassette tape. Now, don't laugh. This is 1991, right? So it was a cassette tape by Deepak Chopra, The Power of Meditation. And I heard a lot about meditation. Um, I knew the scientific benefits of meditation. And so if uh, higher power is calling me to purchase this, I did. I went home and I started to practice meditation. And it literally saved my life, saved my marriage, saved my business, saved my relationship with my kids, saved my health. Right. Um, and I, I began to understand all the struggles I was going through because Wayne Dyer said, God only speaks in one voice and that voice is silence. And the wow. only way you get silent is by slowing your mind down. He calls it the gap between your thoughts. And when you go through the different phases of meditation, your brain slows down. In other words, the way it processes information. So the cycles per second or cycles per minute slow down. So literally your brain is slowing down how it's feeding you information. And that allows you to get quiet and to get in touch with the voice within and to really start to figure out who you are, what you're about, what your highest ambitions are. You know, sometimes it's big stuff. Sometimes it's just, you know, who, who do I need to show up as today? Mason invited him to be on his show. Who do I need to be today? You know, and, um, so it's been a 30 year journey uh, with meditation. And uh, um, like I said, it's been, a, it's been a lifesaver. It's one of the reasons why, why I wrote my first book because the power of meditation is, is remarkably transformative. In fact, I was reading a story this morning on Tom Brady. They talked about you know, how he's become such an iconic athlete. It's because he's so intentional in his lifestyle. And he talked about his mindset and how how TM transcendental meditation completely shifted his mindset and how he can process information and stay so clear, you know? Um, so he, he attributes a lot to meditation to his success as I do uh, humbly don't put myself in the same sentence with him, but uh, I do as also. Got to respect greatness. I mean, it's incredible what, what he has done. And if, if he is doing it and, and you're, and you're watching these people that are so successful doing these things, it's, it's always good to, take a few things here and there from such successful people. It's funny that you mentioned the word intention because actually on Instagram this morning, just got done with a workout and I posted on my story. It was a it, intention was the word that came to my head. And I think intention and then the action behind that intention is what gets the ball rolling for us. So how do we live a life of intention? It's a great question. And, um, I'll start by saying this, um, in our current culture, in our current world, we are bombarded with constant distraction. If we're not observing our environment, I like to call it conscious awareness. So intention comes out of being consciously aware of how you show up, what your thoughts are, mm. who you're being. So conscious awareness is, is the foundational root. So awareness brings thought, thought brings intention, intention leads to action. So what are we allowing into our sphere of influence? Who we are allowing into our sphere of influence? Um, what are we reading? What are we listening to? How is that impacting our thoughts? So starting first with awareness of what's in our world around us, and what do we choose to allow in? And what should we block out? The hardest can be sometimes our toxic relationships. Mm. And it's easy if it's easier, if it's a friend, it's very difficult if it's a close family member, because how do you shut them out of your life? It's not very easy. But what you do is you send boundaries and parameters of how much time you're going to spend together. Or if let's say, I've had to do this with a family member. If the conversation starts to go in a place I don't want it to go, I completely remove myself from that environment. I won't allow it. I'm not gonna immerse myself into that negativity because that's a choice, right? Emotions are a choice. So I'm choosing a different emotion, which means I'm being intentional. Mm. So be aware of your environment. Choose intentionally how you show up. How am I gonna interact with my wife tonight when she comes home? 
what am I going to do after dinner? Am I just going to sit on the couch and watch Netflix for three hours? Probably not. Maybe I'll read a bit for a while, you know, play with the dog, have a conversation with my wife, and then go to bed or something like that, right? So how do I want to show up? How do I want to act? And then there is self-check. In other words, consistently checking in with yourself. The better you get at this, by the way, the more you do it, the better you get at it. When you check in, you can literally check in and ask yourself, okay, am I showing up with the right energy? Is this the way I want to appear? Is this is how I want other people to perceive me? And so it's kind of how I designed uh, the one minute mindset shift, which I can share with you at some point here today. Um, and it's a whole process of shifting your mindset in one minute, it's four steps, how to do it. That's incredible. I mean, one thing you said there, as far as your wife, you know, coming home, my intentions, and you talk about family, fitness, and business, and how to create balance in there. I know a lot of people, if you're listening to this podcast, you want to learn more, you're ambitious, you're wanting to grow. So oftentimes, I feel like ambitious people, their mind can be chaos, you know, they could be lacking in one of these areas, their fitness may be great, their business may not be or their business may be great and their relationships may be suffering. So how do we find that balance in life with those things as a high wanting to be a high performer, being an ambitious person? Sure. So let me first start by saying that balance in in the um, traditional sense is an illusion just like perfection is an illusion, right? Mm -hmm. So we should strive for excellence. Um, now, let me, let me couch that by saying, you can, you can engage each day in growing your mindset. Like I spend time each morning with meditation and reading and visualization and so on and so forth. So that's working on my, my mental capacity. I call it my mental nasium, right? So I got a spot in my house where I go. It's my mental nasium. Like and then that. I go work out and I take care of my physical health. I work out six days a week. In fact, on March 4th, it'll be my 33rd fit anniversary. I call it my fit anniversary. <laughs> you know, I've been working out five to six days a week for 33 straight years because I make it a priority. My fitness is a priority because I have great ambitions and dreams, which is gonna require me to stay healthy, not only to serve other people, but to be there for my family and enjoy the wealth that we've created. You know, I don't wanna leave it all to them, I wanna spend it before I go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, then I spend time on my, on my business. You know, some days it's 14 hour days, other days it's four, right? And then there's always time in every day um, for some time with family. Like my, just before I got on with you, my daughter texted me. She got a new dog yesterday. She goes, when are you going to come see your furry grandson? I said, I'll be over after the podcast. <laughs> they live just uh, a couple miles away. So, so in other words, even if I engage 10 minutes with family, I focus some time and energy on my family. I spent 45 minutes on my workout, 25 minutes on my mindset, and 14 hours on my business, right? So it's not like, Six hours here, six hours here, six hours here, six hours here. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I think there is no blueprint, right? There is no one size fits all approach to health and wellness, to our sustainability with our diet. And I think too often we get caught up in this, this is the way it's supposed to be. But just like you said, one day it may be 14, the other day it may be four. You talked about the mindset switch and I really am interested in that. What's the one minute mindset and those four steps? How, how do we do that? I came up with this um, many, many years ago, although I didn't have a term for it, you know, at that time. Um, but as I, was, as I was going through my own struggles back early on, and um, if you're familiar at all with personality typing, there's one particular called the Enneagram, which there are nine different personality types. And uh, so my dominant personality type when I'm stressed is to go to anger. So the more stressed I am, the more anger and frustration I exhibit. It may not be specifically driven at somebody, but I just, I get upset, I get angry. You know what I mean? But everyone else feels it. And so and that, that's not healthy. And I didn't exhibit it in a very healthy way. So when I started to feel myself feeling angry, the first thing I would do is check in and say, okay, what am I 
feeling right now? What's the emotion? So step number one is identifying what emotion you're feeling. Could be sadness, could be grief, it could be shame, guilt, depression, apathy, whatever it might be, joy, happiness, whatever it is, what is it that I'm feeling at this time? And they're usually low tone emotions, the, the, the latter that I had mentioned here. So identify what is it so I can acknowledge it. Step number two is identifying where am I feeling? Where's, where's that manifesting in my body? Because Mason, thoughts are language of the brain and feelings are language of the body expressed. Here's what I mean by that. Have you ever gone where you're feeling anxious, right? I mean, really anxious. Maybe you got to get up in front of a large group of audience and you got to speak and right. And you're feeling like, oh man, the heart's pounding. Your palms are sweaty. You're jittery. You're shallow breathing. There's tension and tightness in your chest. That's a physical expression of the emotion you're experiencing in your mindset. So your body expresses it physically, just like sadness and happiness and blah, 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 right? It produces the chemistry to mimic that emotion. We do it in our brain. So I'm feeling it in my chest. I'm feeling it in my, my, my shoulders. I'm feeling it in my palms. So where am I feeling it? By the way, it takes way more longer, at least for me anyway, to explain it than it is to do it. Yeah. <laughs> now step number three is to ask yourself, what emotion would I like to experience now? And again, if I'm about to go on stage and speak in front of a thousand or a couple thousand people, I would say to myself, I want to feel calm, confident, certain, and enthusiastic. So I'll go back, step number four, and to think about a past experience, when I showed up and I just crushed it, I was confident, relaxed, certain, really energetic. And I'll put myself in that past experience and anchor there. Now, if you can do that 20, 30 seconds, what happens is the brain's thought process shifts because the brain cannot have two opposing thoughts at the same time. Therefore, the brain fires differently, sending out different chemicals changing the physical expression. And therefore, in literally in a minute, you've gone from feeling anxious and nervous and you know, ready to jump out of your skin to calm, relaxed, and certain. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. You've got to practice it. But once you do, you can make that shift in a really short order. And then you are in control of you and not your outside circumstances. Wow, that's incredible and that's powerful and that's practical. For anyone that is listening, I always say, take these things that you're hearing from Dr. J and use them in your everyday life. And that those four steps are certainly something that you can rewind and listen to again. You talked sure. about mornings and you've also expressed that you have a gratitude practice. That gratitude is something that is important in your life. Tell me a little bit about your gratitude practice and how it has affected you. When I grew up, um, I grew up in a very negative environment. Uh, we were lower, middle class, or lower, even lower than that. So I grew up in an environment of lack and want, right? We couldn't afford this, we couldn't do this, my friends would do that, you can't do that. So I had this belief system that, you know, um, that life was always conspiring against us. And so that created a lot of negativity. And as I mentioned to you, when I had that seminal moment back in 91 and I started to meditate and I started to learn about the power of gratitude and abundance, I realized that the lack mentality is, is a learned mentality. So in my simple brain, I said, if it's learned, I can unlearn it and learn something different. So I started to study the power of gratitude. And what I learned is, is when you focus on what, you're grateful for, the universe brings more of it to you. Just like if you focus on what's not in your life, you get more of that. You get want. It never, that hole is never fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So I started every morning out by, by, with gratitude. Before I even open my eyes, I give thanks for something, someone, and something yet to come this day. 
Now something, right, could be whatever. You know, just thank you for another day to live out my purpose. Someone, it could be my wife laying next to me or my kids or, you know, one of my great team members. And then something yet to come is a concept of putting out in the universe what it is that you're going to achieve. You put it into thought before it becomes reality. So thank you for allowing me to have an incredible meeting with Mason today mm. that inspired a lot of people and mm. hopefully helped some people change their life, right? And so I did that every single day, every single day. Then I started to write it in a journal. At the end of the day, at the end of my work day, I would write the same thing, but from a business concept. I would think I give thanks for something, someone, and something yet to come. And so morning, end of day, morning, at end of day. And then it wasn't long after my mindset shift from somebody who was very negative and always lacking to someone who regularly attracts abundance into his life. My belief is, is that there's nothing I can't create. There's nothing that I can't attract. I don't see lack. That's, that's incredible. And that's so important, that mindset switch. You mentioned morning and night. And I always press how important those times are when your brain is going in between brain states and your brain is the most moldable at these times. These are the habits that we need to create. In your book, you talk about the eight habits. You talk about eight habits. You don't have to go over all eight, but give me a couple of the big ones that you think. And this is Dr. J's book, Change Your Mind, Change Your Destiny. And in this book, he talks about the eight habits. So tell us a, few, a little bit about that and about a few of your favorite habits there. Sure. So I just went over gratitude. So I don't need to cover that again. Um, meditation, without a doubt. Game changer, life changer for me. Um, affirmations hmm. were really important to me. Are you familiar with them? Yes. So let me just explain briefly for your audience who may not know what an affirmation is. An affirmation is a statement of what it is you're becoming. Not who you are, but what you're becoming, right? I am successful, abundant, and healthy. Now, I may not be successful as I want to be yet or as healthy as I want to be. But the fact is, Mason, the average human being has 60,000 60, thoughts per day. And 80% of those thoughts are negative. I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'll never be successful. Why did I ever do this? I'm such a loser. So we're conditioning eat ourselves and our subconscious mind every day by programming these loops in our brain that we talk to ourselves in disempowering energy, this disempowering tones. So affirmations help break those loops. So now you can begin to speak yourself and empowering, right? Empowering dreams start with empowering words empowering your mindset. So by empowering your words, you're affirming what it is that you're working towards becoming. So an affirmation always starts as I am. I am successful. I am healthy. I am abundant. I am wealthy, whatever it might be. So affirmations, because it, you mentioned before about this different states of, of, of brain function. During meditation, when you get to, when you, get to um, you know, there's, uh, there's beta when you're conscious, there's alpha is when you're conscious, but you just kind of zone out for uh, a second. And then there's theta, which is the state just before sleep. That's when our brain is the most malleable and most, you know, right. it can transform. And so when you do affirmations in that state, you're literally rewiring the brain to fire in a very different way. So somebody who is very negative can become literally positive. So affirmations, goal settings without question. You know, even for higher performance, do you know only 3% of the population has written goals? Wow. That's, an, that's only a, 3%. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And so... It's like, you know, we, we do a program every year called GPS to Success Summit. It's about mapping out your life, your personal life, your business life, your professional life, your health, everything. And when you have a written plan, the likelihood of achieving that plan goes up by a factor of 10, which is very different than just, you know, stating a goal, which is more of a wish list. So goal writing is very, very important too. And then mentorship. Um, I've never, 
uh, met anybody who has had any level of success that didn't have some mentorship along the way. You can call it coaching, mentorship, whatever it might be. But I stand on the shoulders of amazing people and they stood on the shoulders of other people and so on and so forth. So the reason I love doing these podcasts is I just love sharing this stuff because if it can spark one person to think a little bit differently and take different action that may change their life, you know, that's impact. And that's when you know your life has value. Hmm. You mentioned the word purpose earlier. I feel like it's a lot of us that are looking, searching, trying to feel out what is my purpose here on this life? If, yeah. if you're a you know, young adult or you're in your 30s and 40s, you're trying to figure out still like, what's my purpose here? How, how can we draw closer to our purpose? It's a question that uh, I'm faced with often when I meet with entrepreneurs and it's one of the initial questions I'll ask them. And oftentimes they can't define it. And if you can't define it, you don't know it, right? Wow. I mean, if you can't tell me what it is, you don't own it. So purpose really comes, it really comes from, in my opinion, and I've done this for a really long time, it's what is in your heart. And it's why meditation or it could be just quiet time, walking in the woods or prayer or whatever it might be. Whatever you can do to quiet your mind is when we have the opportunity to go within and really get to the core essence of who we are and find out what's in our heart. Now, there are some purposes which, which are wildly ambitious. Elon Musk, wildly ambitious, right? Richard Branson, wildly ambitious. And then there's some purposes all they want to do is, you know, have a nice piece of land and a shed and build, you know, and build tables. Who's to say that that's not right? And I think there's this illusion that your purpose should make you a ton of money. That you're, you know, it's said if you, if you can tie your purpose to your paycheck, you'll never work another day. And it's true, it's true but that's not always the case. So it's really finding what you love to do and that you would do it for free if you could. And here's the, here's the last hint on purpose. The only way, in my opinion, you find purpose is you need to have many, 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 many life experiences because it's in life experiences you find out what you like and what you don't like, what you resonate with, what you don't resonate with. So you just gotta go out and live life and you'll find your purpose. In other words, you can never find your purpose on the couch. <laughs> and that's, that's what this podcast is all about, right? Everyday action, extraordinary mindset. It's being able to act on all these thoughts and ideas, these things that you have. This is how this podcast came to be. It was all these things in my head that now I wanted to manifest into reality. And I knew that, hey, I don't know anything about this medium. All I know is I think I can help somebody. And in the same way, I'm helping myself by acting, failing, learning, learning how to build a business, learning how to build a brand. So everything comes back to action for me and I can't preach that enough. And, and you just did a great job of that. You've spoken about experiences and you like to travel. So tell me a little bit about your travel and kind of how that's helped, helped your view of the world and the way that you view things now. Wow, that is, that's a, it's an awesome question. I think travel provides perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you travel out the United States, you really appreciate what we have here. There are no, there's no country on this planet that has the riches, the resources, the opportunity, the freedoms. And we can argue about that in some respects, right. you know, um, and the opportunity, like, as, like I mentioned, that we have here. And it, it doesn't mean we're better than anybody. It's not what I'm trying to say but it gives you such a great sense of appreciation of what we have here. And I think, I think oftentimes people who speak most ill about this country have no perspective of what it's like outside this country. Cause if they did, they wouldn't speak as ill about the country as they would. But I've been fortunate enough to travel to um, five of the six, seven continents. I will be getting to the other two once this damn pandemic's over. You know, I, I've gone and spoken, you know, um, um, you know, in many, many, many different countries. And I'm grateful for that. But I love people. 
I love meeting people, just getting out, having conversations, allowing, uh, learning about them and their cultures and learning about their history. Like before I go travel somewhere, like I'll read something about their, I want to learn about them. What's, what are they about? You know, how did, you know, I was in Ireland last year and it was phenomenal. I had such an incredible time. Just loved that country. But I, I did some studying, you know, to know their history. I didn't know their history. Um, so I'd like to do that. It just, it's just incredible because I believe that, you know, um, we are human beings and that what makes us unique is our ability to connect on a different level. And, and that's what's really fun about, and, and certainly, of course, the culture, the food, the art, the, the um, you know, the music, that's always fun to learn. So lots, lots of great, great uh, benefits to travel. I've, I've been able, at a, at a younger age, I was almost forced to. And it was something that at the time I was like, I felt all this hate, hatred or you know resentment towards my dad or whoever it was but now I look back and I'm like wow I got to adapt to these different situations have to meet new people not get too comfortable I've had the opportunity to go out of the country and and see those kind of things and speaking of food and, and experiences and wine I know that you you consider yourself quite the wine connoisseur I went when we went to Italy and the tapas and the different wine and I've kind of started going into the realm of, you know, Spanish wine and Italian wine versus just your California wine. So tell me a little bit about your passion for wine and, and how that kind of brings us together. When I was a little boy, my grandfather used to have those jugs, these like gallon jugs with a screw on top. And uh, my grandmother would have the box, you know, and I remember every day at lunchtime, she would make, you know, some Italian dish and they would have their wine, hers out of the box and his out of the jug, which is on the side of the table. You know, I was like five or six and, and, uh, and he, you know, that was part of the tradition. Like he would share his wine with me. I mean, I'd have a sip or two, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a forbidden fruit. It was, it was part of the culture, the experience. Right. And, and, uh, as a five or six year old, I mean, I didn't really like it, but it was fun to do. And, uh, but as I got older and, 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 and I appreciate the culinary experiences of pairing food and wines. That's how really uh, my passion grew is, is understanding what wines work with food and just how to make, because there's nothing to me better. The, the, best, the best experiences are with family and friends, incredible food, incredible wine, and great conversation. I would take that over. Like if you said to me, define what wealth looks like to you, that's what wealth looks like to me. Awesome. Yeah. It's, it really is something that, and that's, what's so cool about travel too. You get to see how cultures, you know, slow down in that time of yes. people. And I, that was one of the biggest eye openers for me in, in uh, Spain was like, man, it, everything is so slow. Yeah. Slower around that time. And it's almost like you feel like you, I was on vacation. There's no need for me to rush, but it was like, why is everything taking so long? It's because they have like these two, three hour meals. They bring out so many different dishes. You're drinking wine, you're talking, you're hanging out outside. Like there is no rush. And in America, it is, seems like that constant stimulus that go, go, go all the time. But yeah, I totally agree with you. It's, it's, it's quite, quite the experience. The first time we were in Tuscany, um, we were in, <clears throat> excuse me, we were in Cortona, and, uh, which is a city on a hill, and it's, it's, it's uh, built around this, this fort. It was, it was, you know, it was, it was uh, back in the uh, first century. That's what they used to protect them from the invaders. Uh, and it's just amazing. I mean, it's just remarkable. Um, but anyway, so... Yeah, I mean, we're walking around and, you know, we have lunch at one o'clock from one to three and then all the shops shut down. Like there's nothing. <laughs> Everyone goes, takes a nap, you yeah. know, there's no shop. And then the shops open after dinner. I was like, well, that was so unique and different. So after about 637, then the shops would open up again till 10, you know? Um, so it's just a different way of life. It's not better or worse. It's just different. But I found it, I found it pretty, um, pretty interesting. Yeah. It is relaxing. I feel like it's, it is so different than what we're used to, but it, that's just part about being able to get out and experience those things. You, you talked earlier about how you've been working out for, you say 30 years for five to six days. 
and diet and fitness. We talk about mentality and mindset and, and running a successful business. And I think those two things, diet and fitness, the way that we take care of our bodies, just hand in hand affects everything else that we're able to put out, our energy levels, our sleep, all of these things. So what are some base level for anyone that's like, how do I start eating healthy and how do I start getting an exercise routine? How would they do that? It's a, it can be complicated, but I want to simplify it as best as you can. Not, you mentioned before, not uh, one size doesn't fit all. Okay. Um, so we have a program called Peak Nutrition, and what we do is DNA testing. So we help our clients understand based on their genetics, what are their best macros? And you'd be surprised, more people than not need more fats in their diet than they're getting and way less carbohydrates. Mm. And that's what their genetics is saying as far as optimizing um, the burning of macros as fuel to maintain good healthy weight. And then of course there is the nutrition to support cellular function. Now there's certain elements to nutrition that what we call essential, which, is, which means is that no matter how well you eat, organic, non-organic, you know, a completely vegan or paleo, whatever diet you're eating, it doesn't matter how well you eat. There is no physical possible way you can get these, enough of these nutrients into your diet to create what we call sufficiency. So there's two aspects to this, Mason. There's deficiency, lacking, and sufficiency, right, health. Most people are in a chronic state of deficiency, which means their cells are deficient of the essential nutrients to express health. Now, the problem with that is the longer we are deficient, that's what causes genes to trigger to express disease. Now, just because grandma had heart disease and your great grandma had cancer, maybe breast cancer, doesn't mean you're gonna get it. You may have a genetic marker, but it's lifestyle according to a AMA report back in 2011, 94% of all diseases lifestyle rated. So for chronically deficient in essential nutrients, what happens is, it triggers our genes, what we call above the gene, epigenetics, to express that gene to trigger heart disease or cancer, whatever the case might be. But it doesn't have to be that way if we are sufficient. So how do you create sufficiency? Making sure your nutrition is right. Making sure you're eating right to your genetic profile making sure you're exercising properly, making sure that you're getting the appropriate amount of sleep and getting your REM sleep, making sure you're properly hydrated and you minimize as much of the environmental toxins as possible, which is impossible to do. You can't eliminate it, but right. minimize it, right? And, 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 and go through detoxification periodically to cleanse your body of all the impurities that exist in our environment. That's how you make sure your genes express health as opposed to sickness. And it's just a form that I figured out over 33 years, 25 years as a practicing chiropractor, specific uh, focus on wellness and nutrition. Um, you know, we've done this, you know, with tens of thousands of people. And it's, I mean, it's what I live, right? So <clears throat> you can't sell what you don't own. So if I came on here today and I said to you, and you saw me and you're like, man, this guy's out of shape. I mean, he looks like he's 153 years old. You know, you're not buying what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. So I've got to live it myself. I've got to be the epitome and the example of that's why we own, we own, we own some fitness studios. We own a weight loss, you know, our nutrition. So it all ties in together because, you know, it's all about maximizing health to its fullest capacity. It, it's, it's not, like I said, it can be complicated, but if you know the formula, it, 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 you can, um, you can be healthy in a, in a, you know, and get healthy and stay healthy. Yeah. It's so crazy that you mentioned that because you're the third guest that I've had on this week that has talked about epigenetics or genetic testing in terms of being able to find something that's sustainable and actually works for you based on your unique genes, because we're all so different. And that's like you said earlier, the one size fits all approach. It's, it's, it's not a thing that I think 
should be sold, even though it is sold to an extent in today's health world. Well, interesting that you said that because you said sold. We've been, we have been sold as a society, a bunch of BS. Mm -hmm. And let me explain. We've been told that we're a victim of our genes that again, right? If grandma or grandpa had this or mom or dad, whoever you're screwed, you're going to get this. And we buy into the BS. And so we become victimized and therefore we feel, well, if I'm going to get it, what the hell's the difference anyway? I might as well just, you know, you know, eat all the crap that I like, never exercise because it's hard. And, uh, you know, and then I'll, when I get cancer, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get sick and die. But it doesn't work that way. As I mentioned before, 94% of all, gene, all diseases lifestyle related. So you have direct control of your destiny based on the lifestyle choices you make. And I'm going to add one additional thing. Obviously, we've gone through a pretty tough time with the pandemic. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people have struggled. A lot of people have suffered. I just want to make two points. One is, you listeners need to think about one thing. You have to make the assumption, if we're in the middle of a pandemic, the overall death rates would have skyrocketed in proportion to the amount of deaths as it relates to COVID, right? I mean, it just makes sense. It's just logical, right? However, do you know there's been zero in fact, in 2020, the overall deaths were actually slightly less than it was in 19, 18, 17, 16, and 15. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a second. I thought there's been 400,000 deaths from the pandemic. Oh, but wait a second. Did you know deaths from the flu are basically non-existent? Heart disease for the first time in history has decreased, and so is cancer. Is it possible we've reclassified people who are at the end of life, who are a month or two away, maybe contracted COVID, and we called COVID as the cause of death when they were really two or three comorbidities in and they were about to pass anyway? Absolutely. And then the final, and the final point I wanna make on this, and I have to emphasize this to your listeners, if you're someone who has been just freaked out and really fearful about COVID, getting exposed to COVID, get, you know, here's the reality. You have the greatest pharmacist inside of you. Mm. Our body, our body has sustained this species for 40,000 years. Through 39,900 years with virtually no pharmacology. How is that possible? Yeah. because we have this innate immune system an acquired immune system that adapts to its environment that when we live life exercising healthy choices our body knows exactly what to do and how to keep us well and how to keep us safe if we focus more energy on how we live as opposed to avoiding stuff we're in a much better place and we'll get back to normal life as quickly as we should. Yeah, it's being proactive and not reactive. Right? Amen. Yeah, and that's, that is a concept that I think can stretch to so many different degrees of life. As, just as much as if you wake up in the morning and the first thing that you do is check your phone, you start scrolling. What are you doing? You're, const you're immediately putting yourself into a reactive state. You don't control yeah. what's popping up. Versus if you're spending time in the morning to meditate, set your intentions, gratitude practice, like you said, you are then being proactive and setting your path. So I think that's an incredible way to look at that as well when it comes to overall health. I think a lot of people sometimes would feel this word as stuck. And as I'm looking through your Instagram, I see you talk about this, this feeling stuck. How do we not feel stuck in life? Everyone goes through ruts and stuff, but how do we get out of this stuck feeling. I did a program last uh, in the last year uh, that there are three kinds of people in society today. There are those who are devolving, those who are revolving, and those who are evolving. So let me explain. So devolving are people who are just, they're stuck in fear. They are stuck in, in a mindset that they're contracting emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially. In other words, they no longer have control of their life. 
And those are people who are focused on outside rather than inside, in their head and in their heart and in their body. And then there's those who are revolving. They're on the hamster wheel of life. This is most, this is the greatest portion of the population. This is the stuck people you're talking about. They get up, it, you know, it's funny, the other day, uh, the movie Groundhog was on. Yeah. And I watched it. I had seen it a long time. I was like, man, it, it's funny, but true. You get up and you have the same day over and over, right? You get up, you look at your phone, you go to the bathroom, you kick the dog, you pour the coffee in your cup, you get in the car, you're 10 minutes late to the office, whatever the case. You have the same day over and over. You come home, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know in, in an ironic fashion, I think this statistic is 68% of the people go to work each day to a job they don't like, and they come home to us and 56% come home to a spouse they don't like. Hmm. Right. So they're on this hamster wheel and life sucks and they know they want more. They just don't know how to get it or how to get off this wheel. And that's the stuck people. And then there's the evil. Those are people who are practicing gratitude, who, who work on their mindset, work on their body, who live intentionally. And that's a small percent of the population, about 5%. And I mean evolving because they're growing. You see, in life, there is no stagnation. You're either moving forward or moving backwards. Now, we're all aging, can't change that. But you're either evolving emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, or you're devolving. And the fact is, the faster you devolve, the quicker you are on the way off this planet. So how do you get unstuck? First of all, you have to acknowledge that you are stuck. Second of all, you have to identify who in your sphere of influence or someone you know, like a podcast, right? Where you can learn about some of these, these really important life skills to help you begin to shift your mindset. Because getting unstuck starts with unsticking your mindset, shifting your thoughts. Okay. And it starts with gaining clarity. What do I want my life to look like? And sometimes, Mason, it's easier for people to ask the question, what don't I like before they can understand what they do like? Well, I hate this job. I don't want to go to this job anymore. Okay. Awesome. What would you like to do? Well, you know what? I've always wanted to work with animals. Whatever. You understand where I'm going with this, right? Okay. So sometimes you need to figure out what you don't want before you can figure out what you do want. But then once you have that vision, you have some clarity, then it's just start taking action. You and I talked about the show prep. You had mentioned about the law of attraction. And a lot of people for a long time said, that's ah, just all crap. It's not. It's crap because people thought they can sit in their living room and meditate on a million dollars and it was going to fall out of the sky in their lap. Yeah. But it doesn't work that way. But here's, here's how it does work. When you manifest and put thoughts out into the universe, you're literally putting energy out in what's called the field of intention, which is the first supercomputer network in the history of mankind. It's been around since the beginning of mankind. And the good thing is you've never needed a, a subscription to it. It's still there. And the thing is, what we put into it, we get back. So if we put negativity, we get negative. We put positive, positive. But when we put a thought or energy about, about what we want to create, and we put it out there, and then we, make, we take steps towards that vision, even though we don't know how we're going to get there, things start to show up to help us to reveal itself how we're going to get there. That's how manifestation occurs. It didn't happen in my life forever, right? So know where you want to go, setting a course, taking some action steps, and then it's about, um, it's about overcoming adversity because you're going to face adversity. That's what life is about. Yeah. And in my businesses, Mason, when we shift to see our businesses, obviously we have a core purpose, core mission, core beliefs, and core values. But one of our major core beliefs is, is that there are no problems, there are only solutions. And what that means is, is when something arises, we don't look at it as a problem, we look at it as an opportunity. Opportunity to grow, to learn, and get better. And when you come from that standpoint, you never feel like you can't figure it out. And it never feels too big for the moment. And you can get it done. Plus, you show up a lot calmer. And when you're calmer, right, the prefrontal cortex of your brain, which is your logic center, can free, freely think and provide solutions and options. 
But when we see it as a problem, our limbic system responds, which is the emotion center is like, oh my God, this is crazy. I can't believe this is that blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't find a solution in that mindset. So, so that's the steps of getting unstuck. Incredible. There's so many good things that you just said there. And I love how you backed it too with like, this is actually what's going on in our brain. This is actually the system, the way our cells work. I love when, you know, someone as such as yourself puts that into perspective, like, Hey guys, this isn't actually just like a, a thing that we're making up. This is science. Like this is how our bodies work and it's powerful stuff when you put it to work. Like you said, that action. So I know you have a furry grant. Is it a boy or a girl? The dog. It's a boy. <laughs> Son to go visit. So I got one more question. Yeah. All right. And, and that is what is your definition of success? Uh, simple. Um, find what it is that you love, live with passion and live in the service of others. And you'll never be, uh, you'll never be wanting of anything and always feel like your life has meaning. Mm, I love it. Short and sweet. And that's something that I encourage everyone to ask that question. Like ask yourself what that is to you. And, and like you said, you'll, you'll live a life of, of need. You won't have need. You won't have need in your life. So. Right. Thank you so much, Jay, Dr. Jay. Where can everybody find you on social media? And if they're interested in your services as well, where can they go find you? Uh, thank you, Mason, for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, this time went really fast. I hope your listeners found great value with this. And if they want to learn more, there's a few different places they can check us out. Of course, the podcast, Power, Passion, Prosperity. It's all one word with Dr. Jay on any of your favorite podcast apps. They can go to the powerpassionprosperity.com website. They can learn about, you know, the events we're running virtual and live, um, our coaching services, our nutritional service. We have a lot of different services that we offer to entrepreneurs and professionals. And then on social media, it's at Dr. Jay LaGuardia, J-A-Y-L-A-G-U-A-R-D-I-A. -A I'm on Instagram and, um, and Facebook. Uh, I deleted my my Twitter account because that's a cesspool and, and I just did not want to engage in that negativity. <laughs> it definitely can be. And I always say that, you know, you need to be able to filter through social media, how it makes you feel the things, the emotions and, and the people that you follow. And you're definitely someone that will give positive output when you see you pop up yes. on your page. So definitely go follow Dr. J and, and thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, same here. Thank you so much and best of luck going forward. I, I know you're going to be really successful.